God favored me. God favored me. I'm not saying that for you to say amen. I'm just telling you God favored me. I don't need you to salute that or clap for it or anything like that. It's simply an acknowledgement that God's been good to me. He's been good to me. And I know I'm not the only one that God's been good to, so it seemed like somebody in here should have been saying, God favored me too. Yeah, he favored me. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can't get mad at me because he favored me. The only, he ought to get mad if I don't acknowledge that he favored me. I, I said to you before, favor isn't fair, but it's frequent if you're faithful. It's not fair. Yeah, it doesn't, everybody doesn't get a same dose of favor because everybody doesn't put the same faith cup up. Y'all don't hear me. But everybody wants the same result. Everybody wants the same results every time, regardless of their input. They want the same result. Hear me now, you, you mature enough to understand this, that if you don't put in what other folk put in, how can you expect to get out what other folk get out? Now I realize it's all grace, But the Lord knows who does what too. He's paying attention. He's blessing those who bless him. He's favoring those who favor him. Now, every now and then, somebody who doesn't favor the Lord gets an ancillary benefit. Yeah. If Farmer Jones prays righteously and is a good man, faithful and devout, and he prays, Lord, bless my crops. Let my crops grow. Let them be bountiful. When God gives him sunshine and rain, guess what? Farmer Brown is going to get some of that sunshine and rain too. Just because his farm is next to Farmer Jones. But God is favoring his own. Now, if you feel strange about what I'm saying, maybe it's because you're not connected to him like that. If you feel strange about somebody, if you think it's bragging when God's been good to somebody for them to say, God's been good to me. That's not bragging. That's a statement of fact. That's a statement of, of fact. He's been good. Good, good, good. So good. I started a prayer series last week called Have You Got a Prayer? Have You Got a Prayer? Since our emphasis this month is on prayer. And we thought that we would do all things prayerful. Bible study, morning prayer call, six o'clock every, every weekday. Prayer concerts on Saturday. Bible study focused on prayer. At the end of September 2016, you ought to know something more about prayer than you did when we started. You ought to. If you got a mind to know more about prayer, you ought to know something. There's too many opportunities for you to increase your knowledge and I'd say grow in your faith. And so what we decided to do during the sermon series was to look at some of the prayers of some of the saints in scripture and see how they prayed and why they prayed and the responses for their prayer. And last week we had the occasion to look at Daniel. And Daniel taught us how to pray with humility. And we talked about how he prayed Daniel was a good one to tell us how to pray with humility. He knew something about prayer. He knew something about prayer. I thought about it when I finished preaching last week. My wife was quick to tell me how long I had preached. I 
It's all right. I don't mind her telling me that. Uh, I told her to take it up with the management. <laughs> you got a problem with that. See the boss. But uh, she, uh, I told her in all that preaching about Daniel for an hour, I didn't mention one time that he had been in the lion's den. And that's what most folk know about Daniel, about his time in the lion's den. There's so much more to us than some people realize. We can learn so much more from folk than what is obvious about them if we simply take the time to study them, to learn about them. There's so much more than the obvious. Now know this, being in the lion's den for a night will make you pray. <laughs> Some of y'all been in the lion's den for longer than a night time. Yeah, you ought to know how to pray. But let's look at another patriarch of the Bible. His name is Paul. His name is Paul. The New Testament identifies him as one of our greatest saints, but he started out as an ain't. Yeah, he started out as the greatest ain't. He started out, if we use the common vernacular, he started out as a straight hater of Christians. In fact, he hated literally Christians so much that he was trying to kill Christians. But something happened to him. And the something that happened to him was no mystery. It was no mystery. He met Jesus. Now, he met Jesus in a strange and unusual way. He went through a process that we won't go through, but God needed to get his attention in a special way. And so Jesus gave him a special visitation. He met him, and it changed his life forever. And he set about helping to start the new church and writing about how we as believers should conduct ourselves. And his writings have been instructive for all of us. But not just his writings. Or not just his writings. It would be one thing if we just looked at his writings for the theological purposes. But in order to really know Paul, you got to learn some things about Paul. Paul went through a lot. And one of the things we can do is look at how Paul lived his life, Cam, and how he lived his life and what he did can be instructive to us as well. Paul was a prayer. He prayed. And his prayers are beneficial in that they were written down for others to see. I wonder what would happen if you wrote down your prayers. I wonder what would happen if you recorded all your prayers. Would they be helpful to other people? Ask yourself that question. Or would your prayers simply be a list of I won't, give me, you forgot, did you hear me, it's me again. Would you ever mention anybody else in your prayers? Would you ever put somebody else's needs or your prayers for them? Are you ever interceding for folk in your prayers? Or is simply, are you using prayer like the colonel, was he a colonel? Use the I dream of genie bottle. Major, major. Is that how you use in prayer? You think you got this? Are you trying to say abracadabra and you think God's going to answer your prayer? Are you mature enough to understand that we're in a relationship? This is a relationship with him. And we got to learn how to communicate effectively with him. And he understands our failings. He understands our frailties. But he also has some expectations of us. And I've come today to talk to you about that. We talked about how to pray with humility the last time. Today I want to talk about how Paul teaches us how to pray with power. How to pray with power. With power. Everybody wants more power. But how to pray with power. And the reason I was a little confused earlier, Tam, is because 
I thought I had listed the responsive reading scriptures based on my sermons <clears throat> until I realized I flipped the sermons from this week and last week, which is why that Luke scripture is going to match the sermon next week. And uh, this Ephesian scripture, which is going to be listed as our responsive reading next week, and we'll still do that. But the New Living Translation of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21 is going to be the foundation of our message today. Will you let me read it for you? Paul writes, when I think of all this, and maybe I should give you this header, he had just finished from verses 1 through 13, talking about how he loved the brethren, and then he went into this long speech about how good God has been, what God has done to bless us, and he talks about that for quite a while. It seems as if he has gotten completely off field because he starts out seemingly with a prayer. And before he can get down into it, he's just going on and on about the grace of God and how it's secured for us. All of our blessings and all of the, uh, the riches that we have today. And if you have time, I in, in, invite you to read uh, verses 1 through uh, 13, because they'll lead you there. But then he goes on, after talking about how we got to this point, and he writes, for when I think of all of this, the reaction is that I fall to my knees and I pray. Pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then he goes into a doxology, a benediction. He said, and now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. We're used to hearing that in the King James Version that reads, and now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages world without end that's what we used to used to hearing I just read it in a different version this prayer from a theological standpoint and it is a prayer, and it's personal. But this prayer from a theological standpoint is what we would call a Trinitarian prayer. A Trinitarian prayer. That's not complicated. It simply means that through this prayer, Paul makes mention of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit right there in the prayer. That's all Trinitarian means. And if you look, verse 14, he says, I kneel before the Father. Verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. And in verse 17, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. A Trinitarian prayer mentions all part of, most of the time, it's common that we pray and we pray to the Father in the Spirit because of the Son, Jesus Christ. But I need to tell you, it's all right if you're praying and you're praying to Jesus Christ, it's fine. You don't have to be confused about that. They are equally part of the Godhead. 
If you say, oh, Holy Spirit, help me now. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. You haven't done anything inappropriate when you do that. It's appropriate to adjust, adjust, address Jesus and the Holy Spirit when we pray. But the prayer is different, Amy, in that most of the time when we see people praying, they're praying for their bodies. Help me to heal. Help me to feel better about, help my arm to heal or my leg to heal. Most of our prayers deal with our outer circumstances. But this prayer is different because this prayer is focused completely on our inner self. Paul's desire is that we learn how to strengthen our inner being. He's more concerned on what we're doing on the inside. That's why our theme this month for our prayer series is growing from the inside out. Because if we can grow from the inside, then it'll strengthen how we deal with situations on the outside, if we can grow from the inside. But this prayer is written by Paul while he's in prison. And it's interesting, when he is limited in his mobility, He's got a Roman guard with him everywhere. His circumstances are such that he can't dictate when he comes and when he goes or what he eats or who visits him. When all of his freedoms have been shut down, the freedom that he does have is the freedom to be all he can be internally. And that's what his writing comes down to. I want to tell you how to be free, how to grow on the inside because the outside ain't looking too good for me right now. And so he focuses on the inner Paul, on the inner person. And this prayer focuses on our need for power. I bet if I ask for a show of hands in here, everybody in here would ask the Lord for more power. Oh yeah, you want more power. But the question is, to do what? What will you do with the power once God gives it to you, if he gives it to you, the word power or strength is used four times, four different times in this passage. And it's the second prayer that Paul records in Ephesians, the second one. The first one is in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. If you get a chance, go read that. In that one, Paul is asking for enlightenment so that we can understand God's power. Help us lift the shade off of our eyes. Help us to know just how magnificent and how powerful God is. But here in chapter 3, he's praying for empowerment so that we can use God's divine power. Now, that's a big difference. There's a difference in God using his power and in us having access to being able to use the power. Whoever gets into a car has a lot of power under their control. But if your mama's driving the car, that's a completely different thing than when you are driving the car yourself. And that's what we're looking at here. Who is in control of the power? I like the fact that Paul shows us an example when he starts to pray. The first thing he does is kneel. I bend my knee before the Father is what the Greek says. He literally kneels down before the Father. And I need you to know that bending your knee is an act of humbleness, humility. It lets you know that you're going before someone who is greater than you. You're giving them respect, and that's why we kneel. But God is not overly concerned about the posture of our bodies. What he's concerned about is where we are in terms of our heart. Do we have a contrite heart? Do we understand that we're not coming to God and to him as equal? Because he's always in charge. And to keep us aware of that fact, Paul uses the term and refers to God as the father 42 times. 42 times in his letters he refers to God as the Father. And he uses, Ms. Daniel, the same word that Jesus Christ used when he was referring to God as Father. You call somebody Father, that, that means intimacy. 
Pedro. That, that, that's a connection. You got to be careful who you calling your, your daddy. Because everybody doesn't meet the definition of being a daddy, a father. Today is Mia and Padre Day, I, they told me, isn't it? Yeah, today is Grandparents Day, and we, we, we don't even, we don't even, today's generation doesn't even use the terminology granddaddy and grandmama. Everybody got to have a different name these days, but it's the same thing. It's that upper generation in the family. You can call it what you want, but that's what the grandparents are. But it does denote familiarity. It denotes intimacy, and that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that because of Jesus Christ, I'm not just saved, I'm in the family of God. That's important. God sees me as his son because a father takes a different look at a man when it's his son than when he's not his son. He says, and you need to know this, God is the creator of everyone. So based on that, he's the father of all creation. But he's only the savior of those who have accepted Christ. And so only those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our savior can come to him as God our savior. That's a big distinction. Verse 16 starts with this. I pray that, I pray that, that's how he introduces uh, this prayer. I, Father, I'm coming to you and I, and I pray that you will bless me with four different things, he says. And I'm going to walk through them with you because I think they are in, informative in how we ought to learn how to pray to Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we just don't know what to say when we're praying. And if you're honest with yourself, sometimes you just don't know how to come to him and talk to him about what you want. I mean, you got it in your mind what you want, but, but sometimes you need to learn how to interpret it so you can say specifically to the Lord what you want. One theologian says that we're not unusual in this manner, that most people don't know how to pray. Most people don't know how to break it down so that it's understood. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's simply an opportunity for us today to grow and to learn how to do it. And so today, Paul makes requests of the Lord. And he says, I want to receive power from you, Lord. And he's not talking about God's ability to just bless us in general. He's talking about God's specific ability to empower us under circumstances that we need to be empowered. He also suggests that we have the ability to ask this of God and God will answer us. He says, not because you can, you can uh, 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 demand anything of God, but because, because God is gracious and he loves you, he'll give you these things. In other words, God wants us to, I mean, Paul says uh, that God wants us to experience a portion of himself. He wants us to understand just how much he loves us, and there's a limitless supply of love that comes from him. And so the first thing Paul says is he asked the Lord for strength, for strength. He said, Lord, give me strength. Strength. First request is for strength. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, that is the evidence you have that you are saved. Not having the Holy Spirit in your life begs the question of whether or not you are truly saved. If you look at Romans 8 and 9, it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if you have the Spirit of Christ and are saved, then the power of the Holy Spirit comes with that salvation. The power is simply a part of the package. And the word that he keeps using here for power is dunamai. 
the same word that we use for, I want you to understand how much power we're talking, the same word for dynamite. We're talking about that kind of power. The same word for being dynamic. If you say somebody is dynamic, we're talking about the same kind of power. So let me ask you this question. Does anybody in here ever feel spiritually weak? You ever feel like you just don't have enough when it comes to your spiritual engine to get up and go? I, I know you do, even if you don't say you do. I, I know it's true. I have to get up on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning just about, and preach. And I can tell you right now, sometimes my engine, my, my meter is way low. Way low, particularly when I have to come in here and look and you ain't paying attention to me. My meter is way low. Yeah, because for some reason, people think I'm supposed to come in here and entertain them every Sunday. And that ain't my job. That ain't my, that's not even my desire to come in here and entertain you every Sunday. And so if you get here and you find yourself not able to concentrate, it's not because of me, it's because of you. Because your spiritual meter is too low. You need to be connected to the vibes that are flowing. People forget that sometimes. They, they, they think that I'm supposed to have them up clapping every Sunday. But I wasn't with you on Saturday. So I don't know what's pulling on you. I, I don't know what you've been through Monday through Friday. I, I don't know what's pulled on you all week. And you wanted me to get you from zero to 60 in a word. You want me to get up here and holler something, and you write back to vroom. But it doesn't work that way for a whole lot of reasons. One reason is because I'm not always at 60. Sometimes I got to pull on you to get where I need to go. And I wonder if I had to depend on you like you got to depend on me. If I would make it into the pulpit some Sundays. I wonder if I'd even be here some Sundays. That's why my power doesn't come from you. Your power doesn't come from me. Our power comes from him. And have you opened a connection to him to feel the power? Because the power is always there. A whole lot of us, instead of seeking strength from God, we go to friends. We, we go to folk and try to get power before we turn to the Lord. But the only one who can strengthen us spiritually is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who can refresh you, who can revitalize you, and who can empower you to do the things that you need to do. He does it on the inside. Well, that's important. He empowers us on the inside. That's where God works. That's where, that's where he lives. And that's important to know that even though sometimes my body might be weak. Anybody over here ever have a weak body? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even when your body is weak, your spirit is strong. Oh, yeah, you say I'm growing in grace and in power and the strength that God has given me even though I can't walk today. Even though I'm laid up in this bed today. And that's really important as we get older. Oh, yeah, because if you just... George Jones, keep living. Your body is going to get weaker. There are going to be some things you can't do. Me and Deacon Miles laugh about it all the time. When I first came to 45th Street, I'd run around here. I'd be running up the stairs back here, getting to my office. And now we meet up sometime, and I'm walking them one at a time because my body is getting weak. In fact, this morning, he came in there and brought me some pain medicine for my knee. Because I'm getting older. My body, if you live long enough, your body is just going to get weaker. But you ought to know that even if your body is getting weaker, your strength, your faith can grow and grow and grow. And you can be stronger. And so the first thing Paul asked for is for strength. Give me strength, Lord. Not only does he ask for strength, he said, not only do I need strength, Lord, I need you to give me, let me go deeper. I, I want to go deeper in my relationship with you. We are, the Holy Spirit can empower us to be strengthened. But don't you want to go deeper? Don't you want to go deeper in your walk with Jesus Christ? Aren't you tired of drinking milk? 
Don't, don't you want to get into the meat of what's going on spiritually? And, and when your folk have conversations, they say, that's deep. I want to I wanna know something, something deeper. I'm tired of getting them little cards in Sunday school and, and not understand. I'm tired of having to get the same lessons taught to me over and over again. I want to go deeper. Yeah, I want to I wanna go deeper. And, and Paul uses... Three, three concepts, three pictures, if you will, to give us an indication of what spiritual depth is, of how we go th- deeper in Christ. He said, he uses three verbs. One is dwell, one is rooted, and another is established. Established. See, God wants us to be more than just, just saved. There's some folk just satisfied with just being saved. I'm saved. And, but, 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 but he, wants, he wants us not only to be saved, but he wants us to live like we're saved. To live differently. Don't you know that it's the living differently that changes the world? Not just that you made it across the line, whew, I'm safe. But now you take it and you do something different with your life. And it's the doing something different with your life part that affects somebody else and helps them get saved. When you become an example, and the only way that can happen is if Christ comes and dwells, lives in your heart. That's when you're going deeper in your relationship with him, because folk can tell when Christ is on board, when he's living in your, in your heart. Let me give you this example. One theologian, Robert Munger, wrote a booklet entitled, My Heart, Christ's Home. I, I wonder if you recognize yourself in this. He, he, he pictures the Christian life as a house, and Jesus Christ at salvation comes into the house and he starts going from room to room. This is in your life now. He's going from room to room and he goes into the library of your mind and starts to clean up all the trash you got in the library of your mind. He starts pulling out some of them books and magazines that you've been living your life on and he's getting rid of the stuff that doesn't help you at all. Yeah, I'm sure in this day and time, we'd have to modernize it. He'd probably have to go in and change your Facebook page. Because your Facebook page does not reflect somebody who is Christian. No matter how much you say praise the Lord, no matter how much you put all that stuff out there, it doesn't represent what Christ represents. And so he has to come into your home and straighten it out. He replaces the library you got that you picked up with the word and the things of the word. And then he goes into the dining room so he can look at what your appetites are. And he starts cleaning up and giving you new palate for what you're eating and taking into, into your body. He starts replacing all these sinful desires and this worldly menu you have with something that's more holy. He starts replacing all the materialism and pride and envy and lust that we have. And he starts replacing it with love and with, it, with purity. Some of us think we're going to starve if he took everything off our menu that we, that we like. But the truth of the matter is, there's enough mer- nourishment and love to take care of you. Oh, 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 oh you, you need to hear me on this now. That, 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 there's enough in there to take care of you. We spend a whole lot of time pining for stuff that'll do no good when we finally get it. Anybody like me ever wished and worked for something you wanted and then when you got it and you realized it wasn't worth nothing? And it sure wasn't worth what you put into it. Yeah, yeah. Some people have done that. Some people have done that. Some people have worked, pushed good stuff aside so you could go get some junk. And you find it, but you didn't know it was junk because junk can be dressed up real nice and can look real pretty. Yeah, some folk found out they wanted the latest coffee off of and they didn't realize that a Yugo wasn't going to take you nowhere. 
but they spend a whole lot of money, time, work, overtime. Yeah. Gave up some opportunities to get a nice, nice Honda. Nice whatever. Toyota. And they said, us going to get a Yugo. And couldn't hardly drive it off the lot. So they realized, now sometimes you go his name husband. Or wife. And you done put a whole lot into getting them. Only to realize it was a you go. And you gave up something. You know what I'm saying here. But, but, but when Jesus goes through and cleans out your house, he finally comes to that one closet you got. Everybody got one. You know that closet that you push all the stuff in, the one you scared to go into yourself that you don't want nobody to come to, that if somebody comes visit your house, you tell the children, don't let nobody <laughs> open this door right here. And in fact, don't you go in the door. You, 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 got, a, you got one of them in your, in your house. Yeah, you got some stuff you done pushed way down. And, and, and so far, some of us have pushed it so far down that we almost forgot we did what we put in the closet. But, but guess what? He knows. He knows. And your greatest fear is that other folk know what you got in that closet. But, but let me tell you this right now. And, and, I, and this is important. He will come into that closet. He will clean that closet out. And he will forget what was in that closet. But the only way he comes into that closet is if you invite him. He won't come in there unless you invite him. But when you invite him, when you invite him into your dark, secret, sin place, he'll clean it out. But that's what it means to let him dwell in your life. Not only does he need to dwell in your life, he also needs to be rooted, Richard. He needs to be rooted like a tree is rooted in your life. You know what roots are. Have you ever seen folk who, have you ever seen a tree that's so tall and so pretty, but a wind can come by and knock it down? Some folk are rooted in Jesus like this. You know it. You know it. They run around. They're always arrayed. Finally, whenever there's something going on, they're the first one at the church. But let the first ill wind come in their life, and they tow up. Tow up, crying, wailing and gnawing, and have no depth in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you, the standard ought to be this. Your roots ought to be as deep as your branches are wide. Think about that now. As wide as your branches are, your roots ought to be that deep going down. And some folk got wide branches and spoon deep roots. Oh yeah, yeah. That's always my people have the depth of a spoon, which is not very, deep at all and that's why let me tell you what happens when you got spoon deep roots somebody say something to you and you get upset and then you cast a power all over the whole church as opposed to the person that said it to you that's spoon deep roots that means you're not trusting in Christ you're trusting in those circumstances that's not deep enough and you need to pray Paul is saying pray that the Lord will come in and dwell and take root deep roots in your life. And so is your foundation sure enough? And the last thing he says, he needs to come in and establish himself in your life. Establish himself. I wonder if the people you are around regularly would say that you have an established relationship with Christ. I wonder if some of them even know that you will have a relationship with Christ. And Paul is saying, if you want power, then you have to pray that the Lord will strengthen you. You have to pray that the Lord will come in and go deeper in your life, be firmly planted in your life, and that he becomes established in your life. That's if you want power. That's if you want power. He's got to come in and establish himself. And once you have this kind of relationship, 
Once he goes deeper in your life, Paul says, you can begin to comprehend, that's the third thing, comprehend what's going on in the spiritual realm. You can grasp it. You see, some of the things we talk about in here, you ever seen something go over somebody's head? You say something and you realize automatically they don't understand what I'm saying. They don't. You don't, they don't understand what I'm saying. And, and one of the things that helps us when we grow together, when we get deeper in Christ Jesus, then you push me to have deeper messages. But think about it. Look at the congregation that I'm preaching to right now. I'm talking about kids who are as young as 10 all the way up to senior citizens. Messages have to impact everybody in here. But imagine if we were deeper. If we could go deeper, then we would all grow in that relationship. I understand that you feel like it's the preacher's job to make you grow. But that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. No preacher is qualified to be the Holy Spirit. What a preacher does is come and enlighten you with the message that Christ has given us. And if you're in tune to it, I can tell you right now, if you go out to your car, turn the radio on, it's probably transmitting. Let's say it's transmitting from 98.7. That doesn't mean that 107.7 isn't transmitting. It just means you're not in tune to 107.7. That, that's the difference that comes. You might be catching a signal, but it might not be the signal that you need to grow. That don't mean that 107.7 isn't doing its job, pushing out the message, having a grand old day. It simply means that you're not in tune to 107.7. One of the reasons that people can't get in tune to 45th Street is because they stay up in some other church. Uh-oh. I'm sorry, let me get back up over here. Let me get back over here. One of the reasons you can't hear me is because your voice, you hear, you tune to somebody else's voice. When, I'm, when, 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 I'm, when we're in a crowd and I say, Karen, she better look to me. I shouldn't have to change my voice or do anything. I just say, even in distress, she better understand, that's Andre calling me. You know why? Because after 30 some years, she's tuned to me. And if you've been sitting here long enough, by now, after 13 years, you ought to be tuned to what I'm saying. You ought not be pointing the finger at me telling me I don't hear you. That's a problem. That's a problem, and it ain't my problem. Because I stand up here every Sunday, and I tell you what thus saith the Lord, and I know after seeing 13 years, somebody's been changed. I can tell some folk are growing. The question is, are you in tune to what's going on? Do you comprehend? What is it, does it mean to comprehend? One reporter asked uh, Louis Armstrong to explain jazz, Fiatha. And, and Louis Armstrong said, man, if I got to explain it to you, you ain't got it. <laughs> and that's how it is in Scripture. Every time we're trying to explain comprehending the Word of God, and we have to do it every single time, and it's simply, let's go back to you're not in tune. We're trying to help you understand how deep and how enormous God's love is. Paul goes in verse 18, he lays out the dimensions of God's love. He said, when I'm teaching you about it, I want you to understand, this is what I'm trying to get you to understand, uh, what I'm trying to get you to understand about this, Frederica, is I want you to understand how deep God's love is. I, I want, he, said, he said, I want you to understand how wide it is. Oh yeah, God is so wide that it can reach out to anybody anywhere. He said, I want you to understand how long it is. It's so long that it can stretch from the time Christ came out of that grave until now. It's so long that it can reach back and get the saints of old. That's how long his love is. 
You say, how high is it? It's high enough to take all of us to heaven. That's how high his love is. And how deep is it? It's deep enough to reach anybody. No matter how low in life they have sunk, that's how deep his love is. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. That's what I'm trying to use analogy after story after to get you to understand and comprehend how much he loves you. And once you've gone through it and once you've asked him for this strength and you understand how deep it is and you understand and you start comprehending how much he loves you, that's when you reach a point of, of having a fullness of God. Yeah, you just, I'm just full of him. I'm just, I'm just full of him. More comprehension leads to fullness. And that's what he says. He says, verse 19, he says, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. That you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. So the question is, how do you contain the uncontainable? How do you do that? How do you, how do you put into you what can't be put into you? And yet God is trying to put all the love he can inside of you. And you got to be wanting to receive what God is giving you. It's your, it's your desire that sets the limit, not his love. The more you want to receive, the more he's able to give to you. And we start messing up because we start measuring ourselves against other people. We look around at folk who we think are devout, who we think are full of the Holy Ghost. That's not your measurement. You shouldn't be basing how much God can give you on how much he's given somebody else. When you do that, you're limiting God. But you are the one who's suffering as a result of that. Don't base how much you grow on how much you think God has given me because he's able to give you exceedingly, abundantly more than he's given me. And guess what? He's given me such as I need for what he needs me to do. What does he need you to do? We're already positionally full of Christ because we accepted him as our savior. So every one of us has the Holy Spirit in us. Christ is in us because we've accepted him. But practically, there is no limit to how full you can be of Jesus Christ. And you need to understand that you are your greatest barrier when it comes to feeling the power of God. If you ask him and prepare yourself to receive more power, he'll do it. But he's not just going to give you power for giving you power's sake. That's something expected of you to deal with that power. In the last two verses of this scripture, after he tells us what we need to do to receive power. So if you want to start praying with, praying with power and living with power, open your heart to it. But in order, look, 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 look now, you know this is true. In order to be filled with one thing, you're going to have to take some other stuff out. The problem with that is some of us are too comfortable with the stuff we already have in. Some of us are already too comfortable with how much we know. And because we're comfortable with what we know, because we know better, we won't make any room for Christ or for God to show us better. But you're going to have to offload so he can fill you up. The songwriter said, here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up. Another songwriter says, that you, you got to come in empty. And that's what you ought to try to do. Whenever you go into a worship setting, Lord, I'm empty. What, what does it say? I give myself away. You, you need to fill me up, Lord. Fill me up with all that you think that I need. Once you reach that point where he's filled you up, once you reach the point of acknowledging that you are without the power you need, and that in order for him to give you the power you need, you're going to have to make sure that you are deeper in your relationship with him. I, I wouldn't expect that Nicholas would be as deep in scripture as I am. Not at his age. But I have an expectation that the God I know 
can make what I have in terms of my relationship seem as nothing with his potential. If he would simply open himself up and ask the Lord to bless him and fill him with all manner of love and grace. There's no telling what Nicholas can do. And I look forward to the day when Nicholas, who has opened him, himself up, can come in and be my teacher. Because God has blessed him with more, more, more of him. And my question to you, are you courageous enough to ask the Lord to give you more? Because he'll do it. But be careful when you do it now. Because friends will start looking at you strange. Yeah, they'll start saying, you, 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 you seem full of something. Yeah. And, and you can say, well, it's not full. I'm not full of myself. It's the Holy Ghost that I'm full of. And some of us are so comfortable where we are that we won't let God move us where we need to be. We won't do it. He's got a greater blessing for you. It's out there. But you won't do it. And I can tell you right now, if you're thinking that you, I've been doing this for so long that I don't know if God can change me. Can I tell you, like, like, like Paul wrote, he's able. He's able. Don't, don't, don't limit what you think he can do because he's able. Not, not, not only he's able to do immeasurably more. I like that word, immeasurably. Not a, good, not a lot of time to use it in life. But that means you can't measure. That there's nothing man has that can draw a ring around what God can do. There's nothing man has that can that can see how high he can go how deep he can go how wide he can go it's immeasurable how much God has has for you he tells us that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can ask I love this I love this look 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 if I were to sit down Mr. Daniel and come up with the best plan I have for God and ask him, I'm going to ask God to give me the best, he, the best I can think of. Because I can't even think like him. If I ask him, if I ask him to come in and, and rescue me from my own sin. And I would have come up with a plan for him to do it. There's no way I could come up with a plan where he would say, Andre, for your wretched, awful self. What I'm going to do is give you my son. There's no way I could come up with a plan where he gives me the best that he's got in heaven for the worst that I've got down here. But that's why he can give you exceedingly, abundantly, come up with a plan, he can top it. Come up with a sin, there's nothing he can't bless you. There's nothing he can't forgive. Why? Because he's God and he's all powerful. And sometimes I think we limit him based on our fears. And I'm here to tell you right now, you haven't done anything, one, that hadn't been done before, and two, that he hasn't forgiven before. And all he's doing is waiting on you to have courage to take your heart and open it up and say, fill me up, Lord. And that's, that's, that's all he's waiting on. And once you say, fill me up, Lord, he will pour his Holy Spirit into your heart and his Holy Spirit will come and take up residence. That's how you start praying with power. And let's say you already have accepted Christ. You believe he died and was resurrected for you. But your life seems to have no get up and go. Or if maybe it seemed like you got up and went somewhere and you need to get your life back. You got to do the same thing. You got to say, Lord, I'm tired of being in control of my life. I've taken this car of life you've given me and I've run it into the ditch. And I'm asking you to get it out of the ditch and put me back on the right pathway. Guess what? He'll pull you out. He'll straighten you up. And he'll give you the power you've been missing to drive on with your life. But you got to trust him. And that's my question today. Do you, do you trust him? That's the power he can give you. Don't ask him for power to get rid of your enemies. Ask
ask him for power to love your enemies. Don't, don't, don't ask him to get rid of all your problems. Ask him to let them draw you closer to him. He loves us, y'all. I know how much he loves us. He loves us and the cross tells me he loves me. Why? Because the cross, you see how it's designed? The way the cross is designed is it touches earth. And that means it encompasses everybody around him. That's how it's designed. But not only does the cross touch earth, it points toward heaven. I love that about the cross. This is the vehicle that Christ used to save us. Touches earth, points toward heaven, but the greatest part about it is it stretches out to everybody. There's nobody that the cross can't get. If you believe in the power of the cross that touches earth and points towards heaven and reaches out to everybody, you believe in the power of that cross, then I'm inviting you. You've never accepted him as your saint. Today is the day. You believe you want to be baptized into the family of Jesus Christ. Then I open the doors to you and invite you to come right now. If you've already been baptized. Well, there it is. I hope you were blessed by the God's word. It's my prayer that you will grow from this message. But in case you need a refresher, you can always stop by our physical location and worship with us at 7600 Division Avenue over in the East Lake community. I believe one visit and you'll find out that we truly are the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Looking forward to meeting you. God bless you. Take care.